fellow shepherds. Do you ever think like I do that, that shepherding it can be kind of hard sometimes? Do you ever have thoughts like this? When should I be firm? When should I overlook faults? How do I help someone else see Jesus better? Or, I'm too sinful to be used by God. Or if I can't overcome my own sin, how am I supposed to help other people overcome theirs? But did you know that shepherding can be broken down into just three steps? Three things that, when true of you, make you a good shepherd. But if you're not doing them, or rather if you remove even one of them, mean that you're not really shepherding at all. Are you surprised that there are only three? Do you think there could be fewer than three? What are those three? Well, I'll give you a very small hint. Each one of them can be summed up in just one word, although they certainly don't have to be. Like I said, it's not much of a hint. You think through what those three things could be, what the three irreducible aspects of shepherding could be, and then see if your list matches up with what Scripture says in the next Shepherding School session. Good morning. Do you remember from history class a monarchy called the Holy Roman Empire? It was fairly large, covering much of Western and Central Europe from the Middle Ages on through Napoleon, who put an end to it like he did a lot of other things. What's funny to me about the Holy Roman Empire is its name. It's called the Holy Roman Empire, but it was neither holy nor Roman nor an empire. It's like it's like it didn't really know who or what it was. Now, by contrast, our own nation is called the United States of America. We are a group of states, we are united by a federal government, and we exist in the Americas. Unlike the Holy Roman Empire, our name represents some of our irreducible truths. If you remove our unity, or our states, or our land, we cease to be the nation that we are. Similarly, 
there are three irreducible truths about shepherds. And in training shepherds while he was on earth, Jesus demonstrated those, uh, those three, what those three aspects are. We're going to be jumping around through scripture a lot today, but first we're going to start in Matthew chapter 4, where Jesus tells his first disciples to follow him. Matthew 4 verse 18 through 22 says this, While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in the boat with Zebedee their father, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. If you've read the Gospels much at all, this is a pretty familiar account to you. But what is Jesus really saying to these men? He's telling them to change the course of their whole life. Not because their old life was necessarily bad. They were fishermen in their family fishing business. They worked hard in an honest trade to provide for their families. There's nothing wrong with that, nor is it a lesser calling than any other. Yet Jesus pulled them away from that business, away from their source of income, and told them to literally give up everything else in their lives, lives so that they could follow him around, learning from him, imitating him. That's what Peter was talking about in Matthew 19, 27. Then Peter said in reply, See, we have left everything and followed you. And Jesus calls us to do the very same thing when we follow him. For us, since we can't physically follow him around like the apostles did, it's spiritual rather than physical. Luke 9, 23 and 24. And he said to them all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever, will, whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Ultimately, though, Jesus is calling us to the same thing that he called the apostles to. Change the course of your whole life. Commit yourself to imitating Jesus, going where he goes, going where he leads, obeying what he commands. This is commitment. And it is the starting point for following the Good Shepherd and for being shepherds ourselves. So how do you gauge your commitment? Well, there's a simple test that can, that, that can tell us, uh, that can help us figure out our level of commitment. What does it take to stop you? That's a simple test. What does it take to stop you? When you uh, know you should tell the truth, what does it take to stop you? When you have the opportunity to be open about your faith, what does it take to stop you? In 1996, a team trainer for an NBA team arrived at the team's practice facility a couple hours before practice was scheduled to begin that day. He thought he was going to be the first person to arrive, but as he got closer to the basketball courts inside the facility, he heard a single ball bouncing, he heard uh, shoes squeaking on the floor, he heard the ball hitting the backboard and the rim, and he heard soft grunts. So when he went to investigate, he, he, he was surprised to find the lights were all still out. And what he found was an 18-year-old kid who was shooting hoops in the dark. Now at this point, you might expect the trainer to run the kid off or call the cops or call security or something, but he just stood there and watched the kid. And you know what he thought? He thought, this kid's going to be great. And he was right, because that kid was Kobe Bryant, and he was a rookie for the Los Angeles Lakers. And he would indeed go on to become great, due hugely to his legendary and his insane work ethic. What did it take to stop Kobe from practicing? To stop him from continuing to improve his game? Pretty much retirement. That's about the only time he ever stopped working. Kobe was astoundingly committed to improving. Virtually nothing could stop him. Now ask yourself, how committed are you to obeying and imitating Jesus? What does it take to stop you from obeying? What does it take to stop you from imitating Jesus? Next time you're tempted to sin, ask yourself, is this sin all it takes to stop me from obeying Jesus? Is this one thing that I'm tempted to do right now, is this what it takes to stop me from being a shepherd? Be committed. Follow Jesus and imitate Jesus. Don't let some dumb sin stop you from this incredibly high calling that God has called us to. 
Now, the reality that Jesus calls us to sacrifice everything in order to follow him is a powerful truth. And we should never think we've moved past that point. We, we always need that truth, like a building always needs its foundation. But a building is a lot more than a foundation, and following Jesus is more than just being willing to lose everything and anything. It's never enough to just follow Jesus ourselves. Jesus always leads us, leads his followers to some specific activities. That's what he did with his apostles. Uh, and later with all set with his 70 disciples. He led them, he, he instructed them to do two things. To preach the truth and to meet needs. Luke 9, 1 and 2 records this for us. And he called the twelve together, and gave them power and authority over all demons, and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God, and to heal. And then later in Luke chapter 10, uh, it records where Jesus did the same thing with 70 disciples, sending out a larger group to do the same thing, to go preach and to heal. And so Jesus sent them out. That's significant all by itself. He didn't hold meetings and invite people to come to him. They were already doing that to come to Jesus. He didn't need to do that for his disciples. He sent the apostles to towns, plural, traveling around to where people were. He sent them out to find people, to go see and meet needs. So he sent them out, he sent them to meet needs. He instructed them to proclaim the kingdom of God. This is the gospel. The kingdom of God rests on the fact that Jesus himself is God the promised Messiah, the rescuer of mankind from our sin, that is the heart of the kingdom of God. It's also the heart of the gospel. That truth demands that we reject our sin and our inability to, uh, and admit our inability to defeat that sin. And that inability means that our only hope of forgiveness and of eternal life is to trust entirely and only in Jesus Christ to forgive our sins and to give us spiritual life. That is the gospel, and that is the kingdom of God. And that is what Jesus sent his disciples, his apostles, out to teach. It's fascinating to me, too, though, that Jesus didn't stop there. He also instructed them to heal. Now, healing diseases or meeting physical needs can seem kind of trivial when compared to eternal life and spiritual truth. But that doesn't mean that those needs aren't real. Physical suffering is real. And relieving that suffering has always been something that God has done for mankind. And usually he does it through other people. That's what he does. We are called to those same activities that Jesus uh, instructed his disciples to do. One major theme of shepherd school so far has been the importance of shepherds meeting the needs of others. Our job as shepherds is to meet people's needs. And we do that like the apostles did by giving people what God has given us. God expects us to give to others what he has given us spiritually. We have to help people know him better so that they can be more like him. And our ability to do that is determined largely by how much we know Jesus ourselves, how much God has given us by way of understanding of Jesus. And you have to know Jesus, and just as importantly, you have to Uh, then pass that knowledge on to other people. Pass that experience with Jesus on to other people. God has given it to us for a reason, and part of that reason is to give it to other people. So God expects us to give to others what he has given us spiritually, and God also expects us to give to others what he has given to us physically. Just like God gives us spiritual blessings so that we can give them to other people, God gives us physical blessings so that we can give them to other people. Everything we have is really God's anyway. We're nothing more than his stewards, or in a more modern terminology maybe, we're nothing more than his money managers. How does God want you to use his money to further his kingdom? How does God want you to use uh, your house, or really his house, to further his kingdom? How does God want you to use your abilities, or really his abilities that he's given to you, to further his kingdom? This is service. This is the way of life for those who follow the Good Shepherd and how we are shepherds ourselves. And this is the second irreducible truth, second uh, irreducible um, aspect of being a shepherd. The first is commitment. The second is service. And probably most Americans 
today don't fully apply this principle of service. Literally everything we have is God's. It's God's. It's not ours. We're just God's managers. That's all we are. So what purpose does God have in mind for, the res- for his resources that you are managing? I want to challenge you with something. I want to challenge you to read a book. A book on this topic. It's called The Treasure Principle by Randy Alcorn. Some of you have read it before, and you know it's not a long book, but it's packed with detailed applications and explanations of these principles. I definitely think you should read the book. It's worth it. But far more importantly, I think you need to ask God what he wants you to do with his resources that he has put into your hands. And then I want you to do it. That's what God wants. He wants us to see the things he has put in our hands as his, because they are. To ask him what he wants to do with them, what he wants us to do with them, and then simply do it. Anything less is ultimately stealing from God. Remember, everything we have is his. We better do with it what he wants. So Jesus called his disciples to radical life change so that they could imitate him. And he called his disciples to give others what he had given them. So now what is the final stage of his training of his disciples? Or let's ask it another way. What is the final lesson he gave in shepherd school? The very last thing Jesus told a little band of sheep that he trained into shepherds was to go make more shepherds. And Jesus tells all his disciples to go meet needs and preach the truth. Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus is the good shepherd, and he's also the greatest shepherd trainer ever. As we've seen, there's a clear progression in Jesus' training of his apostles. Commit. Change the course of your life. Serve. Go give people what God has given you, including the instructions to commit and serve. And the final stage is leadership. Lead others to be shepherds themselves. That's what it means when you teach other people to commit and serve. And that very act, giving others what God has given you, propels you into leadership. Commit, serve, lead. Commit, serve, lead. Those are the three irreducible steps, the three irreducible tenets or aspects of being a shepherd. You can't be a shepherd if you're not committed to following the good shepherd. You can't be a shepherd if you're not serving the sheep. And you can't be a shepherd if you're not leading sheep to be shepherds. So where are you in those three steps? Is there anything stopping you from being committed to changing your whole life to follow and imitate Jesus? Are you serving the people around you, blessing them with giving them whatever God has given you? And are you leading them to be shepherds themselves, leading them to be committed, serving leaders? Where are you in those three steps? Ask God to show you where you are weak and ask God to make you strong. He's the greatest shepherd trainer ever, after all, and he wants to make you uh, into a great shepherd Let's pray. Lord, you're so gracious to us to allow us to take part in the work you are doing in the lives of the people around us, to take part in the kingdom of God and in the work you're doing in the world. Lord, please help us to be committed to uh, obeying you, to following you, to imitating you. Please help us to serve faithfully, giving to others what you have given to us. And help us to lead. Help us to lead because we are faithfully committed to serving. And so help us as shepherds to be producing more shepherds. Please glorify yourself in us as individuals, as families, as a church. Please bring us back together again soon. And please lift up your name through us. In Christ's name we ask. Amen. Well, how did you do? How did your list match up with Jesus' shepherd training? Did you come up with commit, serve, and lead? or, Or some version of those? Or... Did you think about our core virtues of truth, love, and holiness? If you did, I'm very proud of you. But also, you weren't too far off. Commitment and leadership both require and reflect truth and holiness. 
while service and leadership are both based in love. So the connection between commitment and service and leadership is very strong between truth and holiness and love. They, they, they are uh, intertwined and inseparable. We as a church exist to inspire and equip believers to imitate Jesus. And we do that by promoting truth, love, and holiness. That shows up in our individual lives as commitment to obeying God, service to others, and leadership to help others commit to obeying God. That's shepherding. That's why our church exists, and that's what God has called you to. Let's go be committed, serving, leading shepherds this week.